So I am lucky enough to talk to uh, Emeritus Professor Paul Kirchner today. Um, and Paul, when I put your name into Google Scholar, I ended up with almost 50,000 hits, uh, including citations, of course. But I know you've published nearly 400 research articles and about 10 books on uh, learning and instruction. So that's quite impressive. In a number of languages also, in Chinese, in Korean, in English, in Swedish, and in Dutch. Yeah, so it's pretty amazing. And some examples of your areas of expertise are uh, complex learning, computer-supported, collaborative learning, lifelong learning. Um, oh yeah, designing electronic um, and innovative learning environments. Did I mention complex learning? Um, so and so when it comes to learning in the workplace, we can discuss all these uh, topics. They would all be interesting. But today um, I would like to focus on uh, the fact that in your opinion, um, learning designers uh, seem oblivious to the basic aspects even of how uh, people learn. Um, that is the research and suggestions of the uh, from the learning sciences. So perhaps you could first explain what those basic aspects are, and then we can dive into the three questions. OK, um, without giving a two hour lecture on uh, cognitive psychology, we'll do it in uh, 30 to, to, to 60 seconds. Um, the basic is that um, we have a number of different memory stores in our head, which we use to process information. Um, we have sensory memory. That's things that we hear, see, feel, touch, and taste. Um, if we don't pay any attention to it, it is as if it doesn't hasn't happened. If we do pay attention to it, it goes to our short-term memory. In our short-term memory, we have to do something with it. It's not only that it's there, but you have to do something to rehearse it, um, think about it do certain things. It's your short term memory is really we call also call it a working memory It's really short. It's really small. It's anywhere between four to seven new pieces of information and it you can keep it for two to 20 seconds without doing anything with it. If you don't do anything with it, it's gone. If you do something with it, you can hang it somewhere in your long term memory in things that we call cognitive schemas. If you already have a schema, you hang it in it. Yeah. Uh, you modify that schema that you have in your long-term memory. And um, if you don't have a schema, you try to create a schema. And we have all different ways to help people uh, to do that. So that when at a certain point in time, new information comes, you can quickly not take one piece of information from your long-term memory, but that whole schema as one chunk of information, bring it into your short-term memory to deal with that new information. That's the you can say that's that's the basics of uh, the cognitive processing of information. And that's the basis for everything we do. It, it, it's just that simple. That's 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 our cognitive architecture. OK, perfect. So those were the basic aspects. So let's dive into the three questions that we have today. Now, I don't I know this won't make me very popular by learning designers, but I think my answer to that is just about everything we know about learning sciences and cognitive psychology hasn't been used by the broadest aspects of the field. And if I go into a couple of the small aspects, what do I mean by that? Uh, things like um, uh, dual coding theory from uh, Char from uh, uh, Alan Pavio or adjunct questions, mathemogenic uh, learning from Ernie Rothkopf or elaboration theory by Charlie Rigolith or even Dick Clark's research on the use of media in education. Those are all very seminal works, which I discuss in uh, a book that I wrote on uh, how learning happens. But those are seminal works, which if you look at if I look at most learning designers and learning design, I see that they, we have a saying in Dutch, you heard the bell ring, but you don't know where the clangor is, where the hammer is. Now, maybe they've heard the bell ring, but they have no idea where the hammer is. 
And that means that you don't get very well-designed uh, learning experiences. Well, I mean, all of the old is now also being studied anew. So you can make all of the old the new. It's like not like it doesn't exist anymore. Um, and we don't know anything about it. But the, but the newest is work on learning strategies by people like uh, John Dunlowski, uh, Dan Willingham, um, uh, Mitch Nathan. Um, they, they, they wrote in 2013 a very nice article on uh, 10 different learning strategies study strategies, you could actually call them, and um, which ones work and which ones don't work. For example, uh, retrieval practice or spacing practice or variability practice that works, and we know that, but rereading and highlighting, it doesn't work. Although if you look at people who are then studying the study strategies that they use, they primarily do things like rereading and um, highlighting and those types of things, and they don't make use of retrieval practice, space practice, variability of practice. So that's one, the work by Dudlowski. I think you could possibly give them the link uh, to that article. It's uh, an open access article. And another thing, and then it's maybe blowing my own horn with um, Jeroen from Merienborg, is the work that we've done on four component instructional design, 10 steps to complex learning, um, working with um, uh, whole tasks in task classes, with the proper amount of, of support and guidance so that um, learners don't get a fragmented, uh, atomistic um, uh, pieces of knowledge and know how to use it and transfer it into new learning situations. Those would be two, two of the uh, new things. I was, I was like I say, um, Rich Mayer's uh, cognitive theory of multimedia learning, but that's based upon dual coding theory, uh, cognitive load theory, and information processing theory. So that's something new, that's an aggregate of, 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 of three old things, but I shouldn't be too, denigre, too, too negative about that because, I mean, um, if you look at uh, 10 steps to complex learning and four components of instructional design, that's based upon uh, elaboration theory and uh, cognitive load theory. So it's also a um, synthesis of the old to make something new. I mean, there, 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 there are about 48. You can read my books on uh, uh, urban legends or myths in, uh, in, 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 in learning and teaching. But I think the three possibly most prevalent are um, learning styles that they exist and that you can make use of them, tell people to learn better. The learning pyramid, uh, if I tell it to you, you'll remember 5%, and if you do it yourself or explain it to someone else, you'll remember 80% and all of the things in between that. And the fact that people can multitask and uh, that we make use of multitasking to learn more effectively and efficiently and allied to that are things like digital natives that think and work differently. Those are, um, things that um, actually do more harm than good. You could say certain myths, um, if it doesn't hurt, then it doesn't help and there's no problem. But those myths actually hurt quite a lot and make learning less efficient, less uh, effective and less enjoyable. And those are my three holy aspects of, 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 of learning and learning design. You're in there to make the learning experience more effective, more efficient, and more enjoyable. And enjoyable meaning more successful. And those three or four myths uh, don't make it more effective, more don't make it more efficient, and definitely don't make it more successful. <laughs>